Ja, herzlich willkommen, liebe Sportfreunde. Wir sind hier in den heiligen Hallen des VSV. Podcast Nummer 1. Die Besetzung heute, sagen wir, ist einfach top. Wir haben hier den Cheftrainer des VSV. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Rob Down natürlich, wie ihr alle wisst, und den Geschäftsführer des VSV, Andy Napokoy. Rob, first question. I think it was a very intensive summer for you. It was. Uh, we had a lot of work to do building our team. We spent a lot of time. We looked at a lot of players. People might think because we signed a lot of players from the league that that's the only place we looked. But that wasn't the case at all. We, we wanted to get the best players we possibly could. Some very good players from our league became available. And uh, because of that, we signed them, not because they were from within our league, but because we felt they were the best players for our team. So it did take... Uh, a lot of time and a lot of work. But if you don't put the work in in the summer and get the players that you think will give you the chance to have the best team, then you're going to be in trouble when the season rolls around. So the, the summer is very important to build a team. And I was really happy with uh, with the result. It's the third season you are in Vielleicht. The first both seasons you come in while the season. When we play, when did we start in the championship? Can I say this is the team of Rob Down? This is the team he formed? Is this your team? To a certain extent, it's my team, but there were a lot of different people involved in putting the team together. It wasn't just me. Our, our management group uh, were, were very involved. They did a lot of, a lot of work uh, identifying players, watching players, um, and, and discussions and meetings every week to... to uh, to put the team together. So uh, I, I think it would be unfair to say this is you know, solely my team. I, don't, I think that takes away from a lot of the work that a lot of other people did over the course of the summer. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that that's the case. Now, from a tactical perspective, I think that's, that's different because, uh, you know, I'm basically in charge of that. And so from a tactical perspective, it's, there's no question that it's, That it's my team, and I think the formation or the, the 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 formation of the team is is my team in that finding people to play different roles and, and those type of things. I, I think that that um, you know I probably had have more influence there than in previous years for sure. The first trainings are behind you. What's your first impressions of the team? What can the fans of the VSV expect? My first impressions were very positive with uh, uh, with the team. I mean, we felt very confident coming into camp with the people that we had. And nothing that's happened in camp has changed my opinion of that. And in fact, it's, it's made me feel better about the people that we have here. And not just the players, but also the people. You know, we have, uh, I, I think we have very good people here. And, and uh, that's of equal, if not more importance than than the play on the ice, their personalities and how their personalities gel together. And and uh, so I've been very happy with uh, with what's happened so far. And I always joke with, with the people I'm hope, uh, or with our management group, I, say, I always say, I hope I'm, I'm as happy with the team at the end of the year as I am now. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I think we're going to be uh, an aggressive team, uh, an exciting team, and I'm, you know, I'm confident that that um, we'll be a, a team that the, the people of Filac can can be proud of. We're gonna we're gonna lay it out there every night. We won't take any nights off. We're gonna work. Uh, we're gonna battle. Um, are we gonna win every game? I doubt it. In fact, I'm quite confident we won't. But. We're going to we're going to be be very very competitive, and we're never going to make it easy for our opponents. And and we really need we really need the support of our fans. I think that's um, that can be a separating factor between in, in games and between teams that are are comparable. Uh, the fans can make a big difference in in helping us, and and we're going to need that from from our fans and. You know, I'm I'm confident uh, that that um, you know that that we'll get that because we really need it. Oh yes, the VSV fans are known for the good support. You said you want to see an aggressive team. Now the ice rink will be smaller. Is this good for the kind of hockey you want to play with the team? I don't think it makes any difference. We would have played the same type of game that we're 
uh, whether the rink was the same size as it was last year or the, or the rink we have now. And uh, so that doesn't make uh, any difference. Uh, my philosophy um, hasn't changed because the rink's gotten a little smaller. My philosophy has always been to be an aggressive team, a fast skating team, uh, an offensive team. So that the fact that the rink is a little smaller isn't going to, uh, to, to make us any more aggressive than we would have been otherwise. You said an offensive team, that's your style of hockey. Yes, the same new forwards scored more than 170 points in the last season. What can expect the uh, for offense from this? Will we see more goals, more offensive play, more aggressivity? What do you tell to the players? I'm hoping that's going to be the case. But, I mean, we want to be an offensive team, but you, you always have to have a balance in hockey. You can't be a strictly offensive team because uh, you're not going to win games doing that. And you have to find that balance between being aggressive and offensive, but also making sure that you don't give up too much defensively. So we're going to strive to find that balance. When I say I'm an offensive coach, that doesn't mean that I neglect the defensive side of the game because uh, if you don't play well defensively, you don't have the puck. And if you don't have the puck, you can't generate aggressiveness and offensive uh, hockey. If you spend the whole game in your end because uh, you don't defend properly, you're not going to be successful. So you always have to find that balance between being an offensive team, but also paying attention to defense. So even though, again, I consider myself an offensive coach, that doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that we neglect defense. In fact, we start we started our camp focusing on the defensive side of the game first, and then the offensive side will take care of itself. Offensive wins games, defense wins championships. When will we win the next championship with the Eagles? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you have to be, you have to be, and I say this, you have to be realistic about, we have a lot of impediments compared to some of the other teams in the league. Other teams in the league have some huge advantages over us. And uh, the idea is to be a competitive team with the teams that have those advantages. And if you can do that, then strange things can happen when the playoffs roll around. And our, Our goal immediately is to make the playoffs. That's what we have to focus on. That's what we have to strive to do. Am I going to predict that we're going to be a first place team and we're going to be a championships team? I mean, I, I, I think that would be ridiculous to make a statement like that. So I'm not going to say that. But what I am going to say is that we're going to be a competitive team. And again, if we can be competitive enough to play with the top teams in the league, then we'll give ourselves a chance to make the playoffs. And then once you make the playoffs, Uh, I think in almost any league, anything can happen. So to begin with, we have to strive to make the playoffs and then we'll see what happens from there. Like in the NHL, FD in Montreal, yeah. you are from your born in Saskatchewan. When will we see the next NHL winner from Canada? And what is your favorite team? It's, it's, it'll be interesting to see when, when a Canadian team wins, uh, wins the Stanley Cup again. And I, and I don't think it's, I don't think there's as many obstacles as there were in the past. Before there was a salary cap, there were a lot of obstacles. Uh, once the salary cap has come into place, the obstacles become less uh, for, for the Canadian teams. Now, there's seven Canadian teams, and there's, what, uh, 25 American teams. So that makes it more difficult because the odds, just by the numbers of, of the teams that are Canadian, makes it, makes it tough. Uh, but I think it's not, not in a too far future where a Canadian team can can uh, step up and, and eventually win uh, another Stanley Cup. I think 93 was the last time that happened, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, Calgary went to the finals a few years after that. But since then, it's, it's and Vancouver did against Boston uh, in the not-so-distance past. But um, it's, it'll come. It'll come at some point. And as far as my favorite team, Um, I suppose it would have to be Edmonton because uh, I lived there, so there and I worked there, and and, uh, and so I would I would have to say that 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 would have to be my favorite NHL team at this point in time. It wasn't growing up because they weren't in, in the NHL at that time, um, and I still can remember when there were six teams in the NHL. So yes. um, how long ago that was? But I was young then, well, very very young. Um, so. Uh, it'll, it'll happen. It, it's, people have to be patient and the teams have to work. 
You got very young a trainer. Weren't you good enough as a player? I, I played uh, I played junior hockey and yes. university hockey. I know. And I went into coaching while I was still in university. I think if if I would have stayed playing, I, I believe I could have uh, maybe come over to Europe and played at some point. But uh, once I got into coaching, I knew that that was what I wanted to do, and I uh, and, and it was hard when you as a player when you love the game and you quit playing, it's really really difficult. And um, and I loved the game from the time my mother wrote in my my baby book that she seemed to think I had a real love for hockey when I was five years old. So and that has continued on. So when you quit playing, you look for the next best thing to stay involved in the game and coaching presented itself very quickly after I was done playing. And then I just started coaching and I consider myself very fortunate that I've been able to do something I love and make a living at it and do it for as long as I have. I, there's not a day goes by that I, uh, I'm not thankful for that. When you think back, was it easier to be a trainer 30 years ago or today? Well, that's another very good question. I, I, think, I think in some ways it was easier and in other ways not. So as, as the game evolves and as players and people change, you just have to uh, adapt to uh, everything that's going on in the world. And if you can make those adaptations, you can, you can continue doing the work. And again, there's some things that were, were, were easier um, and, and uh, others that weren't. So I don't, I, in general, I don't think it was, it was any easier, just different. It was very different. Okay. It was very different, but uh, I wouldn't say it was easier. Now let's come back to VSV. Last year, VSV who fetched much players who didn't ever play in this league. This year, VSV fetched players only who, who had just played in this league. Was this important for you that the players know the league, know how to play? I, I think the, the number one thing was, again, we didn't just look at players in our league. We were looking for the best possible players to fill the roles that we wanted. It just so happened that we felt that As everything evolved through us going through players and, and looking at all the players that we were looking at and with our budget and everything else, it just fell into place that all the players happen to come from our league. It's an advantage because you know the players better. Uh, when you have players coming in that you're not as familiar with, there's a greater opportunity to make mistakes uh, when you don't know them. There's no excuse for us not knowing the players with our own league. So we built our team to some extent because of our knowledge of the people that were, were in the league. But by no means was it done exclusively that if someone out of our league uh, we felt was a better player that we could afford, we would have signed them because we talked to numerous players that didn't play in our league. But for whatever reason, uh, it didn't work out here. So then uh, we, we ended up with the roster that we did. And, and I think it's an advantage when you have players that know the league, they know what to expect from the league, they respect the league, They don't believe that they're too good for the league because they're coming from a higher league or, or one that's perceived to be higher. So I think it's an advantage when you have players that understand how the league is and they've had experience with it. Thank you for the moment. Andy Napoca is sitzt da. Er hört uns sehr interessiert zu. Ich muss ihn trotzdem was fragen. Andy, die größte Überraschung für mich und die positivste war, dass der Jamie Fraser, der sich ja nicht gerne von vieler verabschiedet hat und plötzlich hat es geheißen, der Jamie ist wieder da. Wie ist das gegangen? Was hast du als erstes gedacht, wo der unterschriebene Vertrag auf einmal aus dem Fax gekommen ist? Fax ist heutzutage nicht mehr. <lacht> so eine E-Mail. Ähm, Na, es war eigentlich wirklich zufällig, also ich habe mit der Daniela, mit seiner Frau immer Kontakt gehabt, weil sie ja gut befreundet ist mit meiner Frau und es war dann einfach so, dass sie mich angerufen hat, ehrlich gesagt, und gesagt hat, er trainiert und er sitzt jeden Tag am Bike und sie hat so ein Gefühl, er wird irgendwie gerne noch eine Saison spielen und daraufhin habe ich dem Jamie gleich angerufen und habe gefragt, was los ist, bin auch gleich direkt gewesen, also gleich zur Sache gekommen und dann sind wir uns relativ schnell einig geworden, ich glaube, er wollte auch nicht mit der Saison aufhören, er war die ganze letzte Saison im Prinzip angeschlagen oder, oder verletzt und dann sind private Sachen bei ihm dazukommen und Corona und ich glaube, mit so einer Saison wollte er nicht aufhören. Das sieht man ja auch in dieser Saison jetzt mit zum Beispiel in Wien. Lackhaus, der Fischer ist jetzt zurückgekommen, weil die Jungs glaube ich einfach nicht mit einer Corona-Saison aufhören wollen, sondern vor Fans aufhören wollen. Und ja, es hat sich relativ ähm, schnell dann ergeben. 
Und vielleicht, um noch einmal auf eine Sache zu replizieren, die der Rob gesagt hat, auch über unseren Sommer. Es war wirklich zwei, dreimal auch kurz davor, dass man ein Spiel aus einer anderen Liga holt, also aus der AHL oder DEL. Also es hat, es hat sich tatsächlich einfach so ergeben, dass die Spieler aus unserer Liga gekommen sind. Aber es waren auch einige Spieler dabei, die jetzt wir oder ich oder der, der Gerhard Rauchenwald oder der Andi vorgeschlagen haben, die wir uns genau angeschaut haben, wo es wirklich kurz vor der Unterschrift war. Aber das ist dann halt wie ein Bastel, das sich fügt mit den einzelnen Teilen. Und ja, es war sehr interessant. Und das war, was just saying, Rob, that, that there were like several occasions where we were very close on signing players from other leagues. So there was just like, it was really like, a, like it was not, not supposed to be every player from our league, but things fell into place and we, we just signed players from our league. Rob, how happy were you when you heard that Jamie Fraser comes back? Will he stay captain and how important is he for the team? I was very happy when it was determined that, that Jamie was going to return. I haven't spoken uh, to Jamie or to the team, but I anticipate, uh, well, I, he'll, he'll be the captain of our team. I, I don't think there's any question about that. It just hasn't been officially established And he brings a lot to our team. He brings a lot to our organization and he brings a lot to the community. He's been here for a number of years now. He's a very solid leader in the dress room. He's excellent within dealing with the fans and, and within the community. So I was overjoyed when, uh, when Jamie decided that, that he wanted to come back. Not only again, not only his play on the ice, but all the other things that he brings that you can't sign. You can't go out and say, well, listen, I'm going to find a leader uh, for our team. You can try and do that. You're going to think you're going to do that, but you don't know for sure. With Jamie, we know for sure. Do you remember that time when we didn't have Jamie yet? I mean, we were talking like every day that we need yeah. this one leader also on the defensive end who can lead also younger Austrian and the Austrian D-man. And then when Jamie was on the table, We got all our questions answered, basically. Yeah. And I think we've added some other people to help him with that. I mean, if you look at Jocelyn, he's a similar type player, so he'll be able to give us some support. Uh, Fleming is the same thing. Kind of all our defensemen that we signed bring a wide variety of, of different things to the table. So he'll have some people to help him with with, uh, with the leadership side of it. And, and it, it becomes more difficult, I think, every year to find leaders, to find people that are willing to step out a little bit and uh, voice their opinions with their peers. And, and we're fortunate, I think, we're going to have some people that can do that on our team. So we spoke about the offensive, about the defensive, and we also must speak about the goalies. You have now the Italian team goalie. You have Ali Schmidt, who's played special good playoffs most time. Will there be a clear number one, or will they change most time? What's your plan? Well, the plan at the moment, and, and this is no disrespect to Ali, is that uh, Andreas Bernard will be our number one goalie. And we are going into the season with that in mind. Uh, does that mean that he's going to play every game? By no means. We have a lot of confidence in Ali, and I think he took a real step forward last year. And there was a time last year, because of the circumstances, where I thought Ali was our number one goalie. I'm hoping that doesn't happen this year, but we'll give Ali every opportunity uh, to battle and, and fight for the job. But going into the season, uh, Bernard will be uh, our number one goalie with his skill, his experience. And uh, and then we'll go from there. And, and Ali will get will be a real solid backup's the wrong word, but a real solid colleague for Andreas. And I'm hoping they can work together to give us real solid goaltending. And I have no doubt that Bernard will be a solid goalie for us. And I again, I have no doubt about Ali either. When he when he plays, I don't anticipate being that a giveaway game because we're playing our so-called backup goalie. I'm going to expect Ali to do the job and give us the same the same ability to win as uh, Andreas Bernard would. Yeah, that's interesting because Rob told me this last year, right? When you said like, especially like this stretch in the playoffs against Klagenfurt, you got the feeling that it doesn't matter if you put Ali in. It's like putting in a number one goalie, so to say. So you're not in doubt of his skill or of anything. So it's just like, we'll see how things develop or, or you guys will see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, going into the season, that's our plan. And I, and I hope that works because if it does, then Bernard's playing well and that's important. 
and uh, Ali will get his time and we'll, we'll, they'll, they'll share the goaltending. I haven't discussed it with them at this point, but like I say, Bernard's not going to play every game because we have confidence in Ali and we'll keep them both sharp and fresh. For as far as another two big talents, Sprachmann and Mosa, these two goalies I think will play at the cooperation club, the Eagles in Kitzbühel. How important is this cooperation for the young players that they can play at the real high level? I think it's extremely important. I think that it gives, it, it's the next step from where they're, where, they're, where, they're, where they were playing last year to the ice hockey league is a huge step. And in order to make that step, you have to take the next step, which is playing in the Alps League, playing against men, playing in a professional league, uh, getting quality ice time in, that, in those situations. So I think it's extremely valuable for us as an organization. I think it's extremely valuable for our players to have that opportunity so they can continue to develop and, and improve their, their skill set and be able at some point, hopefully, to to uh, come here and contribute with us. We'll keep a couple of younger players here. Maximilian Rebernig and uh, Johannes Czernig will sp spend the season with us, is the plan right now. They'll play in, in maybe they'll get some opportunities elsewhere, but that's not the way we're going to start with. They're going to be with us, and uh, they'll get opportunities to play here, and they'll continue to develop here. But for the players that are playing in Kitzbühel, I think it's, uh, it's great for them. Diese Kooperation, Andy, war das einer, auch einer der Gründe. Urbanek wollte ja zum Beispiel noch Übersee gehen. War die Kooperation einer der Gründe, dass er hier geblieben ist? Ja, ich glaube, es war nach der letzten Saison eher offene Kommunikation. Wir haben mit jedem Spieler ein Abschlussgespräch gehabt, auch mit Martin Urbanek. Und zu der Zeit hat er gesagt, er würde es gerne woanders probieren, würde gerne ins Ausland. Und dann, wir haben aber jetzt nie irgendwie die Türe geschlossen oder irgendwas, sondern wir sind froh, dass er da ist. Und ja, ich glaube, es macht auch Sinn. Der Rob hat es, glaube ich, richtig gesagt. Es ist einfach ganz anders als vor zehn Jahren, weil ich würde es auch mit den Jungs miterlebt. Wir haben das auch in unserem letzten Bot schon angesprochen, deswegen halte ich mich da kurz. Aber der Schritt von der U20 in die Eishockey League ist einfach immer größer und größer geworden. Und deswegen ist diese AHL aus meiner Sicht als Zwischenstep, als Sprungbrett sozusagen für die Eishockey League viel mehr geeignet. Und ich glaube, es ist wichtig für einen, für einen Urpse, dass er auch seine Partien in Kitzbühel spielt. Und es ist aber auch enorm wichtig für uns, dass wir wissen, wenn wir Verletzte hinten haben, dass wir ihn jederzeit einbauen können und dass er ganz normal spielt. Und so soll es auch sein. Und ich glaube, das ist optimal auch für seine Entwicklung. Rob, the VSV-Fans want to see players from Villach, Villach and Villach best 25 in the Rooster. What can they expect from the young Villach player? Benji Lansinger played a mm -hmm. fantastic season last year. What do you expect from this year from him? I expect a lot from, from Benjamin. I thought he took a real positive step last season. And I think he, he had a very good summer training and he's going to be someone we're going to count on to be a contributor for our team this year. Ideally, I'd love to have, and I think everybody would, 25 players from, from VLAC on the team. But unfortunately, being a professional athlete is not the easiest thing and you have to have a certain level of skill and commitment and a whole bunch of different things to make that step. And uh, Benjamin, I think, is, is capable of doing that. And we'll give him every opportunity to be a big contributor for our team this year. And hopefully throughout the year, we'll have some other players that might get an opportunity to, to well, they'll definitely get an opportunity to practice with us. And at some point, they may get some game time. Does that mean they're ready for the league right now? Not necessarily. But we'll do whatever we can to promote the local players within our organization. The special teams were last year a big problem most time of the season. Do you think now you have to play to solve this problem? And will the Villach players say again, Benji Lansinger, also get the chance in these teams? I think we have players that are capable of changing the special team situation around. Last year in the playoffs, I think our, our power play was, with the qualification round in the playoffs, I think our power play was over 30%. So it was really, really good. And I think that's the reason we qualified for the playoffs because their power play was so effective throughout the qualification round. We want to pick up where we left off. And I think we have people that can, can play on the power play. Not everybody can play on the power play. You have to have a certain skill set to, uh, to play on the power play. And, and if you don't have that, that skill level, then it's tough. 
I mean, you can play there, but you're not going to be very effective. So <laughs> anybody can play on the power play, but to have an effective power play, you need a certain level of skill and certain other things to make a power play effective. You need defensemen that can shoot the puck. You need you need people that can do one-timers. You need someone that can make passes. You need to be a hungry team so you can get to loose pucks and give yourself second and third opportunities on the power play. Benjamin played on the power play last year for us uh, after I got here and for the most part until he got hurt. Uh, and then we'll see whether he'll get that, that opportunity this year or not. It will depend on on how the power play evolves. And we're going to play what we feel are the best players to fill those positions. And if, if Benjamin's one of those people, he'll, he'll, you know, he'll get that opportunity. We have a new modus in the league and we have three new teams. Or what do you expect from the Liga? Who will be the strongest teams? And the new modus, what do you say? Is this okay? I think the, the, I think the strongest, it's difficult to say who the strongest teams will be because until you see all the teams, you really don't know. Teams can look very good on paper, but the challenge teams face is building a team. And we, you know, we face a similar challenge with our team because we've got so many new players. But having said that, Klagenfurt is a defending two-time champion. So obviously they're a very good team. Salzburg has um, done a lot of interesting things with their roster. They've added some quality players. It's almost like an all-star team in, in Salzburg when you look at the team that they put together. So they're, they're obviously um, a quality team. Bolzano has a lot of the same players as they had last year, and they went to the final. So you have to concede that they're going to be a very good team. Personally, I believe Hungary has no excuse to not be a top six team, being that they're the only team in, in uh, Hungary that plays at our level. So they have a, an advantage in that the top Hungarian players uh, that aren't playing in higher leagues are probably going to be playing uh, there. So they should be a good team. And after that, I believe that this is going to be the most competitive this league has probably ever been. You know, I take those four teams and I maybe set them aside a little bit. And then, um, and, and when I say that, that doesn't mean we concede anything to them. It just means on paper, that's where I would put them at the moment. And then uh, I think there's another tier of teams which we are a part of that has the ability to, to uh, be very, very competitive. And then, uh, you know, there's, there's always a couple teams that seem to struggle a little bit. I don't know who they are. I just uh, hope it's not us, and I'm, com I'm confident it won't be. We all uh, want this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure everybody does. And, and so, uh, you know, we just have to start playing the games. And I'll, I can tell you a lot more around Christmas time where everything starts to sort itself out. But if I was to say today, which is what you're asking me, I would suggest that those four teams are maybe a little bit ahead of everyone else. Whether they'll be there at the end uh, of the season, I guess time will tell. And from the new teams, okay, it's Neumo is back, but Bustadal and Leibach, what do you expect from them? Very difficult, I think. I don't, I don't think it's fair to say that you can concede that they're going to be the two worst teams in the league. I think that would be premature. And I anticipate, until I know better, that they'll be very competitive. And if you look at uh, uh, what Pustaval has done, I think they've, you know, they've added some quality people. And then we'll we'll see how how the season evolves. In your head, do you have the lineup for the first games? How important are preseason games for you? I have had the lineup in my mind since we had our final signing. <laughs> so and 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 to be honest with you, I had the lineup in our in, in my mind as we were signing players. So I sort of had a uh, they refer to it as a ghost roster, you know, and and so in my mind. I said, okay, we need somebody to do this for us. So once we plugged him in, then we need somebody to do this for us. You, you can't have all the same players. You have to have players that can play different roles on your team. So we, we and when I say we, I mean everybody in the management and myself built this team to get the best players we could, that we could afford for the roles we needed filled. And so I've had my lineup, as I say, Even before we started putting the team together, I had a, a vision of what I wanted, the roles that I wanted people to fill, and then it was just a matter of getting people to slot into those 
to those spots. And, and again, I think that uh, we've done a very good job when you factor in all the things that, I mean, we, we, as, as Andy mentioned, we had a number of players that we wanted to sign but couldn't because uh, you know, we're, we're not, um, we don't have the highest budget in the league. So, okay, you pass those guys off, but you still want to find a quality player. And I think, the, I think we've done a, again, I mean, I think we've done a very good job of building a lineup with the budget that we have that can be a competitive team. We didn't, we didn't spend an outrageous amount of money to build this team. We, the organization invested in the team. Any extra money we found somehow, wherever it came from, it was invested into the team. So we did what we could with what we had. And, um, you know, I'm really happy with, with the roster that, that we built under the circumstances. And, uh, you know, we, now we have to, we, we have the roster. Now we have to build the team. And that's going to take some time. And, but I'm really, really confident with the players we have and the people we have that uh, there's no question in my mind we'll be a competitive team. Well, and actually, I have the lineup in my laptop. <laughs> As Rob said, he has it in his brain and I have it in my laptop. No, no shaking. Yeah, yeah. No, Please but actually, when, when, when Rob said this, uh, I was thinking back about the time in June, July, when we basically talked like every evening on the phone yeah, for multiple. Yeah, we talked a lot. And it's interesting how, how, how you build a team in general and how one puzzle piece leads to the next puzzle piece to the next puzzle piece. And we, like Rob said, we had specific roles and specific skill sets we wanted for each position. And yeah, and, and when the player fulfills those specifications we set for us, it doesn't matter if he's from Canada, Sweden, or if he's an Austrian. That's the most important thing, I think, to stay objective and, and, and see this plane without any feelings towards anybody. Rob, you came to Europe and Austria 2011 to Linz. In the first year, you won the championship. You got the nickname SOK Professor. What do you think personally? Is this the right nickname for you? <laughs> and the, the next question frage auch an dich, Andy. Oh, well, first of all, I was very fortunate. The, the situation in Linz was, was a positive one. And, And in all of my years of coaching, it was one of the most enjoyable seasons that I ever experienced for a wide variety of reasons. And obviously winning the championship is, is the one. Um, the professor, I don't know. It depends how, how you look at a professor. What would you consider a professor? I think I, I look at that as a positive thing, but I think what it, what it does in some ways, it, it makes you seem too cerebral and not enough of a person. So I think if people recognize uh, me as a person and then maybe appreciate some of the things that I do from a tactical perspective, then I have no problem with that thought process. I do expect a lot from the players. I do. I told them in the first meeting that we had this year that we, I was going to challenge them in every aspect. I was going to challenge them physically. I was going to challenge them emotionally. I was going to challenge them intellectually. And so I, I think that being a professor, you want to challenge the people you work with in, in all of those areas and more. So if, if that's what the definition means, then, then I'm okay with it. But if they figure I sit back in, my, uh, in front of the fire with my sweater on, smoking a pipe and, and <laughs> not putting the work in or anything like that, then, then I would take exception to that. Andy, as okay, professor, the right nickname for Rob? Well, I don't know, maybe in the first few years in Linz, it was not the right nickname because his hair was way darker than now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, like Rob said, it's always like, I think it's an honor to have a nickname like that. And, and, but when I think about it in detail, I think professor is probably not the right thing because when I think about the professor, he's good at one thing or in, in one, like with school, a math teacher or math professor is good in math and has no clue about biology, for example. I think Rob also off the ice covers a lot of stuff that, that you wouldn't think of him, I would say. Like when I talk to him also about other stuff, also about management stuff, about things, about road trips, about how to treat people. I think it's a variety of, of skills that Rob possesses and that's why he's a coach since 
basically 30 years well <laughs> longer 38 yeah 38 years you don't um, i mean you you know rob how tough the business is it could be over by three years coaching and it's over if you don't succeed and if you don't stay on a high level and i think that's what's most important that rob always stays on that level he always goes with the time because like he said 30 years ago it was a completely different job it was a completely different job description you were dealing with different people who grew up differently so if you don't stay on track and and renew yourself and your philosophy every every year you won't make it that long and that's why i think he he's also always saying he's still learning i mean yeah. you learn every every year you learn from every player from every situation but as far as tactics i mean we talk about it a lot because i have a little bit of a basketball background and it's obviously also five against five and if we discuss tactical things and if rob describes the stuff he wants to do um, on the ice tactically i'll try to catch up i'll try to put my mind into it and if you work with him longer you you get his passion also for detail his passion for tactics and that of course makes him a professor i think no, I, I appreciate that, Andy, and I, I do am, am proud to have that, that nickname. It's a lot better than being the idiot. <laughs> so, uh, but again, I, 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 you know, I appreciate, I appreciate that. And my philosophy is, is to, I'm constantly trying to be better at what I do uh, every day, constantly. And I've been around a lot and I have a lot of experience and I have a, a basic philosophy that and a basic value system that I believe in and I adhere to and that won't change. But I'm always trying to get better in every tactic, every, every way I run practice, trying to make everything as effective as it can be to give the players the best chance to be as good as they can be and in turn to have the best team we can possibly put on the ice. And some coaches believe well, we'll play our game and they'll establish our game. My philosophy with regards to tactics is that we'll play our game, but our game's going to have a lot of different things that we can do. And so we're able to make adjustments that gives us, I, I think, the best chance to be successful. And it puts some pressure on the players because they, they have to be alert when they come to practice because if they aren't alert, it's, uh, they're going to embarrass themselves. Not because I'm going to embarrass them, but they're just going to embarrass themselves by not being able to understand what's going on. And I try and explain it so it's easy to understand. And uh, I've been really happy with our, our team so far with their ability to be focused and, and be attentive to what's going on. So, and now the really last question to both. Andy, how much hours a day you think about hockey? And Rob, how much hours a day do you think about hockey? So, yes, Andy? Well, I started off... I mean, obviously with me, it's it's not that much time because I got to think about a lot of different stuff in my work. So it's not only hockey, but I'll try to stop by every day, basically at Rob's office. Even if it's just a 10 minutes talk, I'll definitely stop by after every game to discuss the game and to learn to also, that's the great thing about it. I mean, a lot of people may think like Rob is in hockey now as a coach for 38 years and, and a young guy like me stops by and but it's totally not like that he's talking all the time and I'm listening. I can also put my yeah. word in or my perspective in and, and he, he also appreciates, I think, me putting my perspective in, which makes it just way more fun and way more communicative down here in the coach's room. So I think that's important and, and obviously, I mean, probably sometimes I have to shut my mouth a little bit more in the future to listen to him. But I think it's you learn and then I learn from Rob. And if there are just one or two things he can also pick up from me or from my perspective, I think that helps. But definitely, I mean, we talk hockey a lot. I mean, Rob obviously loves talking hockey, me too. Um, and it's, it's when you run a club or when you're engaged with a club, either as a coach or a GM, every day is new. So, so every day there's a new challenge. There's something new popping up, another player injured or another player playing outstanding. And so there's every, it's like a soap opera play. Basically every day there's a new topic to discuss. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's how you learn. And you learn by listening to people. Uh, and when I talk to, 
you know, Andy, he's got interesting things, interesting perspectives. And you, if you're narrow-minded and you only think about and believe what you know, then you're not going to learn anything. And I just mentioned 20 seconds ago that I'm constantly trying to learn new different things and improve and get better. And when I sat down in, in hiring, I know, unfortunately, Marco Pival, I wasn't able to come back this year. Um, I really enjoyed working with Marco. I think we, we were a good fit. I think it was excellent. When, but when we were looking for a replacement, I didn't want someone who was going to just not contribute any opinions or any thoughts. I, wanted, I want people that have thoughts and have opinions that can put them out there. And then uh, you, you learn things by having different, different thoughts and different opinions. If everybody is always thinking the same thing, then you become stale and stagnant and you don't move forward. Final last words. I say thank you, Rob Daum. I say thank you, Andy Napokoy. Euch sage danke fürs Zuhören. Ich glaube, war ein toller erster Podcast. Das werden wir eben fortsetzen. Andy, mit wem dürfen wir das nächste Mal rechnen? Das werden wir noch entscheiden, aber ich denke, wir werden immer zwei Leute im Podcast holen und ja, vielleicht geben wir trotzdem mal einen kleinen Ausblick. Als nächstes werden John Hughes und Rick Schofield kommen. Ja. Also das Top-Score-Duo der Liga.